because of their so we support, we support a root the, the the city council's right you know in other words we don't have all the data in to know if the city had the pro proper reasoning behind this but we support any city's lawful and, and procedural right to look into problems brought to them to the, by the attention of their citizens we're just opposed to them setting aside the state law through the moratorium. Yes, um, you mentioned something about the Attorney General. Maybe, I think you were talking about the state attorneys. Yes. Generally, you're going to ask them, ask the office to do what? Can you explain that? Or we're, we're looking into a two-fold process. Uh, the legal question, uh, which I think falls under the, the authority of the Attorney General, since the state statutory, the state law dictates the lawful authority of officers in consent searches. So we would like the Attorney General to weigh in on, on that aspect of it. And two, okay. the standards and training issue, where officers are duty bound to perform their duties under 14-230 and other statutory authority, that they can, they not only, you know, it, what they're looking at is, officers are required to obey orders. They're allowed to disobey unlawful orders. And usually the standard is, is uh, if it's, you know, injurious to life and limb, and then they can complain. They can complain later up to the chain of command. This is an, an area where the Supreme Court has has ruled that it's their lawful authority, like in any other procedure they take. If they do not do that, if they obey the rule, they could be decertified. If they disobey the rule, so what you're saying is, if I understand you correctly, is you intend to contact the state attorney general's yes. office um, to investigate about the what the action that the council has done yes. to consider your viewpoint that yes. is wrong. When you think you might contact them, and, or have uh, you already? We're, we're gathering, as long, and when we're done with the data, oh, we're we're done with that's going to be very soon. Yes, you won't do that until he's done with his report. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. You had sort of alluded to uh, our local DAs deciding not to get involved in this. You, you kind of made a quick reference to it. Uh, could you expound a little bit on, on what you think about that whole situation? Well, I'll use the model of former district attorney at Grant. In the Tinkergate situation, we had the mayor, through his chain of reference to the staff, uh, question the issuance of a citation by a police officer. And that citation was officially issued to that person. Uh, initially, there was some cloud about that, but in fact, it was found out later that citation was issued. The only group person or entity that can uh, void a citation once issued like that is an officer of the court. Through the district attorney's office, a judge, a magistrate, it has to be through that process. It cannot be done as it was done then. And so uh, at that time, the district attorney at the time, Mr. Grass, stepped in and made it clear to the council that what they were doing was about to obstruct justice, and he cleared that up, and, and that was stopped. That problem still happened. And obviously, <clears throat> from what Mr. McGinnis is saying, we were, would hope the very same mayor that had that issue would do better than to create one where now he's collectively brought in uh, quite a few members of the city council to make an official vote, which pretty much uh, stands not only to what happened back then, but a, a much more serious situation. Do you so, believe the DA disagrees with you, uh, Mr. West, that there, was, there has been a violation of the law here? I don't know what Mr. West is thinking, but I, I would be very surprised that he would disagree with our position. He didn't say he disagreed. He said he just wouldn't get involved, that he couldn't get involved because of pending cases and cases that would arise. He made no determination one way or the other. In fact, we haven't had anybody disagree with us up to this point. Can I jump in just one point in yes, response to Byron's question? Byron, interestingly, one other thing I had in my notebook here is a WRAL account of, of uh, because Ticket Gate's been a while um, back, and this, this article starts out by saying, after a warning from a district attorney, the federal city council reversed its decisions, and it goes on to explain that. And what I generally recall, um, which I recall more clearly, was that I believe the district attorney, Granis, issued a letter, and quite frankly, I think that letter was finally produced today in there, um, warning them and counseling them uh, about what they had done, and appropriately, and it worked. He, he got their attention and they reversed the decision. Um, and at least from my standpoint, uh, that's what I'm hopeful of that um, when you have the Chiefs Association, I mean, that is a responsible statewide group of Chiefs of Police. Uh, they use language far, I think, stronger than I. Uh, they said it was absolutely illegal. And, and other very responsible lawyers um, 
when your own in house, I mean, the person that probably knows the most about the legal operations in the specific context of the Federal Police Department, probably Patricia Bradley. And it just seems to me that there's, there's a whole lot of irresponsible people here that are at least suggesting to counsel. And I think, I think Mr. Midget's language in his press release last week was something to the effect that let's slow down. Um, let's look at this more carefully before we launch into legal maneuvers, which can embroil the city in long-term litigation. Um, and, and, you know, some people suggest to me that I'm on a completely lost hope when I'm hoping that there might be some uh, mediated middle ground in this dispute. Um, but if the parties are polarized, if the district attorney won't sit down with us and you know, we can't get city council to let us have six minutes of their time. That's why we have the resort to this type of process. Uh, quite frankly, I would have I would have preferred for the entire city of Fayetteville to hear what Jerry Schrecker had to say, because like him or not, uh, he was on the department a long time. He brings some experience, a whole lot of hair now, more than some of us, and um, was was down there and had positions involving this day. And council might the council could have learned something from hearing from somebody like uh, Jerry Schrecker. And I know the mayor's on record saying, you know, we we kicked this thing around for a long time. And I'm getting, I think, some of the folks over here are suggesting this. And I'm not suggesting it wasn't, but apparently the legality of it, and uh, there are certain aspects of it that apparently haven't been kicked around uh, in a whole lot of detail. This begins, Mr. Yes. Mr. You alluded to legal proceedings, but I gather from what you said you prefer to find an administrative solution as opposed to a judicial solution. So, seeking an injunction or filing suit is not part of the plan at this time, just to be clear. I say, it, I, I say it absolutely is a part of the plan, and I, I can say it's a part of the PBA playwork, the playbook for the over 20 years that I've worked for them. They do not like to rush to the courthouse. They like to give the peace process a chance. One time when they ran the data on the success rate of PPA-sponsored litigation, it was, it was somewhere in the 92, 94% level. Now, now that was long ago, and maybe the numbers aren't as good now, but to answer your question, uh, I, I, I know that they will consider that if that becomes necessary. Um, and I really sincerely hope that it does not because it is going to result in a process of sworn deposition testimony under oath mm -hmm. where we will dig into what has been discussed in the back rooms that we're But concerned. you don't intend to take action to block the moratorium which is already in effect. If, if we have to, uh, I hope that we can. Huh? I hope that we I hope that we can. But you can't rule it out. Absolutely not. Okay. Excuse I, me, did you get your question in? I did get a chance, but I wanted to give Sorry. everybody a chance. He's nice. Go ahead. Sorry. Short and sweet. Um, is it against the law, or is it a law that officers conduct consent searches? Because you guys are talking around policy, procedure, orders, things of that nature. Is there a law that says that these guys must do this or no. else? No, and, and that's a very good point, and I think that's been debated, and even I heard some of the council members, because a consent search is a tool of law enforcement. No more so than an officer has to arrest somebody. Now, there's some prospects when an officer must make an arrest under certain circumstances, but, for example, in a misdemeanor, an officer must be in the officer's presence and follow certain rules. In other words, the law gives officers broad latitude in discretion under the law. And that would be one of those discretionary situations for the officer to have a hunch or an issue with something which would promulgate a request for a consent search. Uh, and, and then depending on what other, other things happen, from, from reasonable suspicion to probable cause, all of that, what the courts have said is that officers just can't go out and indiscriminately make consent searches because they don't like somebody or they kick them off. If, if you're the victim of something like that, obviously that is wrong and that must be stopped. But you don't put a moratorium to stop all your officers. Imagine if this was another issue where uh, on, on drunk driving, we, we thought we had an issue there and they put a moratorium. No more arrests of, of people driving intoxicated until we get this problem solved you'd have other advocacy groups jumping up and saying that. It's not that we are, are as, as what you were saying, that we're 
not listening and we're, or we're, we're overly sensitive. That's not what I'm saying. Well, well, okay, I'm, if I misunderstood you, I, I'm sorry, but we're, it's not that we're overly sensitive to the issue at hand. We very much support the fact that if, if people, if anybody feels that they've been discriminated against or treated badly by the police for any reason, that must be fully and thoroughly investigated. In fact, any officer that's doing this job knows any complaint valid or otherwise, must be thoroughly vetted by the police department to have confidence in the citizenry. That's the bottom line. But in that, you don't put moratoriums to stop all the other officers doing their job while that's going on because you could have dire threat consequences. Excuse me, just, 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 real quick. Excuse me, I had something for you. Just, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, just to let you know, if you want to write this down, you might want to research it yourself. Huh? And so North Carolina General Statute 160A-146, subparagraph 3, the council may not discontinue or assign elsewhere any functions or duties assigned by law to a particular office, position, department, or agency. Tr loosely translated, well no, narrowly translated, our city council cannot discontinue consent searches because they are assigned as a function by law by the state of North Carolina to the position of police, the department of the police department. That's just very clear. Just to be clear, what you just said was it is a law in North Carolina that consent searches are conducted. Yes. 14-152. I'm just making sure I heard the same thing. Everybody that heard the same thing. gives us the authority to conduct consent searches. 146. And Chief Bergenmeyer said at the meeting that it was not against the law and the officers were not breaking the law when they did not conduct the searches okay. as well. Stop the yeah, the okay. law book's about this thing. I believe it. Just the, just the part the police use. That's not even counting the part that the rest of the state uses. So right. so the don't don't expect him to understand, understand well, everything. That's and, and, that, and that's, that's part of the dialogue that needs right. to be addressed here. You're, I mean, right. there's a lot of law. That's why we have to trust you. is part of the feelings. Yes, sir. Do, um, are you or Mike aware of this ever being done elsewhere in North Carolina before this type of action? Is this the first time in this state you know of? This kind of moratorium on this on this issue vehicle. It's, it's certainly the first one that I have uh, ever heard of, and we. How many years? Of experience. Um, well, I ran it. In, uh, I ran it in a database called Westlaw, <coughs> which is which is the lawyer's tool. Uh, I can't find that it's ever been done anywhere in North Carolina, at all. Period. Now, that's not to say okay. that. It's just like, and I'm, for those of you that read my memorandum, uh, you know, I go to the city of Fayetteville and ask them, you know, produce your judgments, orders, in any cases where there's been any finding of discrimination, and they tell me there's never been one, and I do other research, but I don't rule out the possibility that there could be someone, there could be some instance buried somewhere, but it's never been heard of that I've heard. And, and let me What's follow your experience? How yeah, long? 35 years, 15 years as a police officer, 25, 20 four years, I guess it's more than that, uh, as uh, working with PVA, I've never, okay, we've never come across a moratorium. We have come across pocketed issues where a local politician did not like the arrest an officer made. I'm dealing with an officer right now who's facing termination because he arrests somebody that an elected official didn't like. I just got that in today. So these things happen. But to have a collective decision to ban banning uh, something okay, lawful by a council, you've never experienced it. Yes, sir. Um, a couple questions. The first one, you know, there's been a lot of attention given to the mayor, and he's the, you know, the, the, the person at the top, and we all know the statement he made. But the, it was a vote of eight to two uh, to go down this path, and so you know the mayor's motives are sort of in question, is you know political and so forth. Is it the PBA's opinion that? This is all a political deal that the eight members of the council actually were acting because they saw a problem. Do you acknowledge any, for lack of a better term, pure motive on their part, or do you just think it's all a political show? Well, this is one reason we want to get all the data collected before we make a some decision on that. But we will say that it is, it is hard for us to understand that the elected body did not understand that the moratorium was setting aside the law as it seemed very clear. I know they had a uh, dissenting opinion by uh, a, an attorney with the uh, School of Government, although that was a phone call email, not the kind of information that they have received, certainly by the staff attorney, by the General Assembly, and by us. 20 pages of pretty ironclad uh, evidence to show that. So while we are withholding judgment as to their motive, because we want to be fair to them, certainly, and find out <coughs> that, and that, may, that will come as we gather more data, 
it is puzzling to us and confusing to us that they did not see more the, the dangerous road they were heading down by initiating the moratorium. In fact, that night when they started talking about hiring someone versus the moratorium, we were really hoping they were going to withdraw the moratorium and go ahead for uh, the, the uh, investigation to Noble, and that was probably solved. Actually, one more question. I'll be done with my part. I'm, I'm, I'm coming. Um, uh, one, I'll turn him again. One, one uh, statement you made that stuck out to me. You had said that the, depart the whole department has been cast as racist. Um, and now I've followed this issue pretty closely, and it hasn't been my experience that the activists, the leaders of this movement who raised it, have cast the whole department as racist. In fact, I've actually heard the opposite. I've heard that uh, there's a few bad apples, if you will, that are getting the numbers up. Does the PBA acknowledge that that is a possibility, that there are a few officers out there? who may be responsible for the numbers being out of whack. Well, first, Mike, if you want to address your part of it, I'll follow up. It was my impression, Myron, from some of the readings. Now, I, I'm doing a lot of catch-up. A lot of, lot of you folks have been here on the ground. I'm trying to read everything I can get my hands on. Uh, and it was my impression that there have at least been some contentions characterizing the racial profiling, putting it right around the neck of the Federal Police Department. And, and that's really the part that I take some, some umbrage to because it, it's sort of like when Newt Gingrich starts lashing the media, the media, the media, and there might be one or two that, that might justifiably need a lashing, but it seemed to be too broad and, and, and not fair to everybody because I am of the opinion because I know some Federal Police officers uh, I, I believe that many of them are just the kind of open-minded public servants that we would want them to be. I, I guess I feel a little bit better based on having heard what you just said that, that, that maybe those that feel so strongly that there's racial profiling, maybe they're seeing it more narrowly. Now, where I would like to see that go, um, if, if there are one or two or three or however many federal police officers that if they have in fact violated uh, the law that prohibits racial profiling, they need to be called out, they need to be sued, they need to be drug into court, they need, to, they need to be fired, and they need to pay damages for it. Now, we could only speculate, I think, as to uh, getting into discussions of possibilities. Uh, I think there's a little bit of danger there, but the, 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 fortunately our system and our process is if any one of us, as we leave here today, uh, and I too have been stopped by federal police officers. Uh, if, if, if we're stopped and if we feel like that we're mistreated, uh, there are hundreds of lawyers around here and some darn good ones in federal and some that, I mean, all of my career I have practiced in civil rights litigation. Um, the way to approach it is to present it to a lawyer. Let the lawyer do the digging. That's what we're trying to do now. Uh, and if there is one or two or three or however many, if the, if the names are coming up, Officer X, Officer X, Officer X, um, then they need to be called out and sued for it. But I just, I hate for the entire department to take the rap uh, for that kind of serious allegation, just like I didn't like, I don't like what Newt Gingrich is trying to do to you guys. Let, let me, the media. Yeah. Let, let me let me follow up to, yeah, well, let me follow up this is the rest of yours. Uh, police officers, when they do what they do, uh, they, they, they per proceed in their enforcement law by policy, procedure, and practice, and, law, and how they are trained. And those are the criteria used when a person complains on what an officer did as to how that's got to be investigated before they investigate. So, this, there may be an issue that this has occurred, and we, as Mr. McGinnis it says better than anybody could say, that that officer must be held at the highest level of accountability. But to blanket a police department, and this is where the officers are feeling, I don't think anybody's called the officers in a, in a blanketed sense of a bunch of races, because we've got officers from representing all levels of our community. And I don't think that they, they, they're, they're, they're saying that. What they're saying is they're feeling like that instead of looking at what an officer is trained to do pursuant to policy, procedure, practice, and law, 
there's a statement made, and obviously the council must feel that way to put a moratorium on their legal right and duty that also aids in protecting that officer and protecting the citizens as they are using that as a tool and, and using it. So that's where, where I think the feelings come in. So that, and I think that's where, when I said slow down and look at this, I think this input that we could have provided, I think would have been a critical component that helps local officials make the best decisions. You know, they don't know everything, and the best <coughs> local official I've seen in more than 20 years I've been a, a state lobbyist is the more information le our legislators have, the better decisions they can make. Martin, can I, can I follow up just, let me finish an answer I gave to Myron, and then you can get to that <laughs> gentleman. Before you, uh, you, you raised, I think, a, a fair question about, you know, to what extent are we, are we questioning motives of, of all of the people that are serving the city of Fedville? Uh, I, I singled out the mayor for the reason that I believe that his, and I, and I hope I, I was following my notes, uh, it was his reasoning and approach is what bothered me. He was the one that articulated the concerns that I think conflict with the law. Uh, I didn't hear that from other members of council. Uh, I, I absolutely respect uh, anybody that's been in public service. I, believe it or not, was on city council in my neck of the woods for two two-year active sentences until I got paroled. And it was an educational lesson for me. Uh, I, I don't ascribe any bad motive uh, to those folks over there unless and until I hear things under oath. Uh, I'm just afraid that they made a decision, and I said this in my memorandum, without the breadth of full information that they needed. Uh, I, I recall Councilman Massey, he's, he's one of the folks that's been on the council a long time. I remember back in the mid-90s over there, uh, I admired his work. I respected his work. Um, he was working all hours because when I was in Fedville interviewing witnesses, I bumped into him a couple of times. So, uh, no, at least I know that I'm not broadly challenging their motives. They are dealing with what I think is a contentious uh, 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 issue of the highest level of public importance where there's strong feelings, there's emotion, there's, there's competing arguments. So no, I, I don't attack them um, for their decision, but I sure wish they would have slowed down and not pressed the button on the mortuary. And John, back to you for you. Yes, sir. Uh, you were talking about the complaints earlier, <clears throat> and we were told or that you guys were expecting to file a lawsuit today. I didn't know if those were one and the same, and if they weren't, uh, if you guys had an expected date for the lawsuit. No, the, uh, what were, the ethics complaint there's an ethics commission with the city of Fayetteville, and we're, we're going to be filing an ethics complaint, which yeah. would be a separate issue. And that would be against the city council, right? Yes. We're, uh, okay. well, we, we, can't, we, we can't get into that really because so it's filed. It, well, it's a, it's a, the city council adopted an ordinance to regulate that, and there's confidentiality associated with it. Now, once we file it, those that are the complainants, they can waive their rights to confidentiality, and Andrew, it can be. I think that applies to the public employees, not the elected officials. But I have to go back and look. And right, but they, we're, have, we're, they don't act. They, they don't meet that often. The ethics commission. So. Right, uh, but we're 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 a little bit on thin ice there because okay. I don't want to get into some breach of confidentiality and have the egg on our face. But um, I expect that such a complaint is going to be filed shortly, and if. Uh, the city sees fit to disclose it, then that's fine. Mr. Mitchell, and, well, let me, and, and your other question on any lawsuit, what, what we're looking at is there is the possibility of an injunction to, to stop the moratorium, but what we're looking at, we still have a lot of data to look at, and we're trying to get that. And, I, and I'll tell you, what's been interesting here is um, the fact that Noble came in and out so quick, and they're gone so uh, now at this point. And I did seem to feel... Uh, and these are my feelings now, um, and I could be wrong on those, but it seemed like the council that night, uh, last um, a week ago, Monday, were wanting to rev this up a little bit and get it over with. It sounded like they were using and talking in terms of maybe getting it done sooner than later on the 120-day moratorium, which gave me the impression that if, if, if we could talk to them, they might understand our concern about the legality of it. So uh, that all depends on, on the data, like, but we're not going to rush into doing this, even though we'd like the moratorium done now. We're, we're going to do it the right way. Yes. Two or three parts to this question. Yes. Number one, I understand you may have discussed with some you know, not having an objection to a consent form. I'd like to 
either confirm or deny that. Secondly, as this thing shakes out, would you have a problem with officers during the course of a consent search advising the motorists of their constitutional rights to decline? Would you have a problem uh, with advising a motorist that uh, he can be told why the officer would like to search? If, as, as this shakes out. The first part of your question on the consent search issue, all I, what I know is, and I, I mean, and I don't think it's appropriate for me to give the standard as what the department ought to do, but I will say, answer it by saying this, many, many departments have a consent form. Mm -hmm. They utilize it as a tool. They do not require the officer to fill it out. You know, if I came up to this gentleman and said, I want to, I want a consent search of the glove box of your car, would you sign that? You know, that, that, you know, would the person be taken aback? The other thing that officers have to be mindful of when they're using this as a tool is officer safety, citizen safety. When a police officer stops a motor vehicle, now when I was an officer, we had little bubble blue lights, and I didn't know what a taser was, and I had a six-shooter. When I tell people, what kind of revolver do you have? I have officers that look at me like I'm from the Stone Age, revolver every time. But the bottom line is, there were then about 17 to 18, 18 separate things a police officer does from the moment they decided to stop a vehicle to actually approaching the vehicle that they have to do as part of their training and understanding. Now, they've got CAD computers, they've got all kinds of other I don't think they have to put their hats on their head like we used to have to do because that's become an officer safety concern. So in the ever evolutionary process of officer training, which maximizes safety to the motorists, to the citizens, and to the officers, they, they train officers on how to do this. So when they decide that uh, they have a tool like consent search, a lot of times the officer's decision has to do too with the facts on the ground. Where the, where the motorist is, what's going on, what they know about the motorist in terms of past uh, citations or what they've gotten on the computer. So all of that must be taken in, into place. So I don't think any department's going to say you have to do this. But having the availability of a consent form uh, as part of, of an officer's uh, ability to utilize those tools, we see no problem with that and we know that many departments have done that. What about the right to decline, advising the motorist, as in West Virginia, the statewide law just passed, requires the officer inform the motorist that he has a right to decline. Uh, I, I preface this by seeking counsel because it, each, each uh, state has statutory authority that talks about that. And those kind of things usually come from a decision through a court process or something like that that has been vetted by a state law. Now, now, as far as I know, well, it, as far as I know, the state law doesn't say that, and I've really not taken a position on that as to okay. whether our members think that's right or not. But if, if that was part of the dialogue that would help solve this kind of thing, we would absolutely be part of that. And we, we are a legislative advocacy group. We lobby for laws that help our citizens and help us to do a better job for them and help our officers. So we certainly wouldn't discount it as a possibility. Mm -hmm. But right now, you know, we don't have it. Now, Mike, if you know the I, I just I find it to be an excellent question, and, and I don't have a a position or a recommendation on it. I certainly agree with Brother Midget that that is an example of something that if we had a good collegial decision-making environment, uh, a mediation environment, uh, uh, frankly from my standpoint, I suggest we consider any and all alternatives. How about an officer advising the motorist of the reason he would like to search his car? Does PDA have a position on that? Yes, I can answer to that. The motorist already knows why the officer is looking to search. The officer asks him flat out, do you have anything in the car that's dangerous to you or me? Do you have any drugs or weapons in the car? Do you have a bazooka in the car? Do you have a body in the truck? I know where you can say no when you say that in the CBA. No, well, if they, if they say no and you can't search the car, then you can't no, search no, the car. No, no, to the questions, the line of questioning, because it happens, it happened to me, but it's okay. You ask me those things, and I say no to all those things, and then you say... Then I go, do you mind if I search? And I tell you no. And done. Yeah, We're done. Yeah, i got to send you on your way. That should be how it goes. That's not <laughs> how it goes. Well, and, but, and that that's is how, how I've always done. Well, I'm, so, not, I'm not passing judgment on anybody. That's how I've always done. I'm not going to do it. What you're saying is part of the dialogue that ought to be out there. Right. And we, ought to, we ought to have that on the table, fix that, not set a moratorium for every officer who's done it right to not be able to do that. And I think that with the council, that might have been the biggest is issue. Nobody offered an alternative. Okay, do the moratorium? No, we're just not going to do it at all. Whereas you guys won't consent search to look in my car. You won't give us consent search to look at the department. 
Well, and, and all I can say is if we had been part of the dialogue. No, we can send that. <laughs> and we, we as an association, what we want when we do our candidate screenings for office, what we ask local politicians is, and state politicians, national politicians, can PBA be part of the dialogue for any issue that's brought up that's a concern to citizens? Because we think everybody has a place at that table. And if we're there together, you know, this is an issue that I think if cooler heads would prevail, and, and that opportunity has been there. Now, granted, we, we did our screening this last time around. We don't have the relationship we would like to have with the mayor, but he was offered to come. Had that been more the situation? Right. You know, well, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I'm like, well, look, we're, that's ultimately what I think will serve the citizens best and keep the It's office. interesting. Y'all invited the mayor, the city council, the, the chief of police, the right. uh, city manager, the city. Where are they? I don't know. They don't want to hear about it. Disappointed? Yes, we, we are disappointed. And, and what we think the role of an elected official is that they represent the interests of the citizens. That's what they're elected to do. Not sit here and invent these ways of, of creating what it looks like they're solving the problem. Because obviously the problem is solved, we wouldn't be sitting here talking about this. Right. But, I, but we expect that, and maybe I'm a little naive because I'm getting too old to, to be doing this, but we still expect that. And, we're, and that's what we're asking for here as we are in other Let me just further respond to Mr. Thompson. I, I, I would say I was particularly disappointed uh, we drew our proposal at six minutes. We wanted to do two three-minute bites in the apple, about three minutes of legal and about three minutes of, of practical. Uh, I didn't think that was too darn much. And in fact, in, in the history, I mean, Midget has been before the Federal City Council and others around the state, and I am suspect as to why we were shut out last week. Um, you know, I don't think I'm so naive to think that we could have convinced that jury of 10 to change its mind. but. The whole method, the whole fundamental basis of the First Amendment, let's, let's hear it out. Let's give anybody that wants to weigh in, including any other group, a bite at the apple before the judgment is drawn. And I'm really curious as to why we I think that. if you had been present over the last 15 Chief months, you'd have gotten a better feel that Mr. Iman, the Chief of Police, the administrators, had opportunities to bring folks to the table, chose not to. They took a pretty hard <coughs> Council got frustrated and perhaps took a hard line itself, and they, after all, prevailed. Well, we just need to unfrustrate them. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes, sir. With Noble working so fast, um, this moratorium may be lifted any day now. Paul. That's kind of what I was asking, Mike. Uh, but but You're doing your due a due serious question related to that. Yeah. Uh, what if the moratorium is lifted before your review has finished, and let's say consent? searches are allowed again under whatever circumstances. Do y'all still raise this as a legal issue for the future or? Yes, I'll say this. Let me say this. Anytime well, the council I, I, wants to interrupt me, I get a little bit sure. <laughs> I, I, I hope that it would move the necessity for any legal action. I mean, uh, PBA does not hang out with the hope that, that we're going to get to lodge creative litigation. It, it's expensive, it's time consuming. Uh, when we do it, we want to have the probability of success, and that's the PBA's record. I hope, Myron, that if, if, if that happens, that no litigation will be necessary. But what troubles me is, is, is the mentality issue that we have if the city council is going to invade uh, the enforcement mechanism of police procedures, as happened a few years ago at Texas Gates, that's happening now. That's just, that, that's the wrong methodology. We'll be fighting again in two or three years. Well, and, and to follow up to, it, it's still an issue because no issue should be solved the, the way they've done it. And we at least want to get to the point with the council where the kind of dialogue you're talking about is the rule of the day rather than the violation of the rule of law. Yes, sir. Isn't the situation of a temporary restraining order be appropriate in this case since you don't have all the information that you want, but you know you, you what's going on right now is a danger according to your... Point of view. That's a valid point, uh, and it could be the only problem with the TRO is it only can survive for 10 days. Uh, we've fought and obtained a bunch of TROs and PBA cases, and um, we selectively go after them, Andrew, for that reason. It expires in 10 days, then we've got to launch again. And, and, and I say in all candor, uh, and I am sort of getting in this dispute later than, than I would have preferred. There is a lot 
to learn. There's still reams of paper for me to pick up. Um, so I, I don't want to be too apologetic for not rushing to the courthouse because that can be a sin that lawyers commit that get themselves and their clients uh, in a whole bunch of hot water. So we're going, we're going slower and careful and so forth. Let, let me say one thing too, that you know, this is what we in PBA call a boss's issue. Uh, and you know, well, we can't dictate what police chiefs do in city managers, and I don't mind telling you, I've had a lot of city managers who stayed mad at me for 25 years. Because we are the voice of the officers. And we want that to be part of the dialogue. Not every city manager likes that. And, yeah, that's uh, not unusual. You're, you're now representing the department, the leadership. Well, <laughs> actually, and interestingly enough, we are we are still doing what we always do, but we're finding ourselves in the interesting position that we're being supported <laughs> by all those those guys. But um, you know, it really is for them to uh, when citizens bring these issues up to make sure that they address those issues. If we are have a seat at the table. You know, officers are in a paramilitary structure. They obey orders, but they also are not military. They're, you know, in military, you obey the, the supervisor because you're off to destroy the enemy. In police work, you obey the supervisor so that you protect the rights of citizens. Big difference. And uh, although violence is out there, it's not, you know, it's around you, but you've got other things to decide. We bring the voice of the officers as they are really facing this on the ground while supervisors and chiefs and managers have other responsibilities we respect and understand, if they don't allow full dialogue, uh, then, I think every, then I think the citizens suffer, and certainly the police officers do. So uh, had that occurred earlier, we would have very much uh, enjoyed that. As it stands now, if it continues, even if it stops abruptly, which if I, it seems to be that they are rushing to get through this, um, we still have the issue that it occurred, and we want to make sure that city councils do not pick up the baton and try to pull this kind of stunt in the future. The rush aspect is one of the scariest parts of this to me. It's too serious an allegation, there's too much evidence, there's too much data. All of that needs to be microanalyzed objectively, carefully, then apply the law to that and have a conclusion. Well, and, and the city council has pitted themselves against the General Assembly of North Carolina and, and the, the, all the courts, and the appellate courts of our, of our state and of our nation this one issue. And I don't think that's a place that, I don't think they were elected to do that, and I don't think that's a place that they were, you know, perfectly honest they would want to be right now. Ms. McGinnis, yes. as you continue your research, and I guess what you're doing as far as what's going on with the, the situation, regardless of what the outcome is, they say yes, they say no, whatever, do you continue to, do you get your answers? Well, this is probably not what you want to hear, but if the problem is resolved, I'll probably stop and get some sleep. Okay. Because it, it has it has been that intense. Either direction it goes. If they say there is a problem, you still stop. Well, no, if, if, if the problem continues and the PBA says to, to, uh, uh, to load the litigation, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what my client requests me to do. No, uh, aside of what's going on with the council, I'm actually talking about the moratorium, when Noble finishes their research, when they say yes or no, will the PBA continue their research well, on the actual, what, what your findings are? See, I'm, I'm hoping that ours is done before theirs, okay. but I've got, a, I've got a suspicious feeling that they're here on the ground for four days. That tells me, practically, somebody has lit the fire under them for a quick report. Uh, and quite frankly, I'm not gonna be in a contest with them to sacrifice legal research, to miss an issue, to miss a piece of evidence that could be telling. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm optimistic that what I'm doing is going to soon be done. Quite frankly, I, and I don't say this in criticism, I've had to wait on documents from the city. Okay. They've, I was in City Hall Friday and I took out a couple of briefcases loads. And I was back today and I'm going back tomorrow. Uh, I'm hoping that that's going to be useful for something regardless of what Noble finds or or doesn't find it. Will your findings be public record? Uh, depends on what they say. Uh, it, it can be. I mean, I, I wrote them a legal memoranda. They saw fit to put it out there. Uh, that's, uh, that doesn't always happen. Uh, I stand behind it. I put a lot of work in it. Um, uh, so we'll, we'll have to sort of react accordingly. We, we will say that we, we believe the citizens of this community and any community have a right to know the truth. And uh, we stand by that, and that's part of what we discover. 
because we want to get to the truth. We want to, the problem needs to be solved, and the feelings are real. And and if, they, if they're just because people feel that way, or they're because there's some statistical data or evidence out there that people have been abused in any way, then that needs to be part of the record. And, and we, because we can't fix it if we don't, you know, discover it and be honest with the fact that there's a problem. There's plenty to work on. Yes, I'm sure. Thank you all for coming. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.